Enough knife making, says I. Let's go fishing with some custom forged Damascus lures. We're going to make us some 15 and 20 and 1095 steel lures with some nickel thrown in for that extra eye-catching shimmer. Then we'll take these babies fishing and see if we can catch anything. First, though, we got to stack attack our materials together. Make sure everything is flush. The corners and edges are as close as possible. We tack weld that together with the welder, and then we throw that billet into the forge and then press it together into a solid piece of metal under a press. We've cut our billet in two and it looks nice and solid. So we're gonna restack these pieces on top of each other and re-weld them together, increasing our layer count. Okay, but what's going on now? Well, metal rusts, and that's a big deal for a non-stainless steel fishing lure. So I'd like to weld some stainless steel to the ends of our lure with the help of a thin layer of nickel sheet. Let me show you the concept. Our lure has two holes in the end for a swivel and a hook. I'd like those two portions of the lure to be stainless to resist rusting, then we can get a coat of epoxy on the rest of it to keep that from rusting. But why not coat it all in epoxy? Well, the hook and swivel will wear it off very quickly at the ends around the holes. If those areas are stainless though, we don't have to worry about it. We're going to build a canister to go around our new billet. The canister will keep all the oxygen out, which will assist in forge welding stainless steel, which can be difficult to do without toxic fluxes. Here's our piece cut and test etched, and you can see the stainless on the ends. It's really cool. That's exactly what we wanted. So now let's try to make a lure out of it. We're going to put it back in the flame and forge weld it out. And even though the welds between the stainless steel, nickel, and carbon steel are holding right now, it's very possible that they'll pull apart when forged because stainless is notorious for that. It's very hard to manipulate. You've probably noticed by now the stainless steel is in fact pulling away from the rest of our material. And that's sort of a bummer, but it's no big deal. We'll just uh, remove the metal, weld another handle to it, and we'll forge out what's left into a lure. Trying to hammer a little bit of the curvature into here and a swage block would be the tool of choice. I just don't have one. So we'll use the horn of my anvil and see how far we get. I'm gonna get this cleaned up on the grinder a little bit and then we'll run it over to our drill press and try to get our holes into it. It's not very easy to drill a curved surface. So I think I'm gonna have to risk an end mill here
This is going to be normalized at 1550 degrees prior to quenching in oil. And the quench makes it so that our layers of steel will etch differently in the acid, revealing our pattern. Quenching also hardens the steel, so I'm going to have to temper it down and soften it. I tempered this at 550 degrees, by the way, so it's basically sort of spring tempered. It's much softer than a knife, and even though it's still hard and tough, uh, it won't uh, crack or fall apart. Here's the first of several etching cycles in ferric chloride. So the stainless popped off the tips of this one. And I really would like the stainless around the holes, the eyelet holes, you know, for lots of reasons. So I'm going to try one more time. So even though these welds are solid now, under heat and pressure, they're just probably they're just going to pop like they did here. So what I've done is I've ground the stainless off the ends. And we're going to compress it in this direction such that there's there's no pressure to be exerted here as we flat it out. And the, the depth here of the stainless pieces is going to be the final depth of the piece so that we won't be compressing the stainless and hopefully we'll keep the stress off these forge welds here between the stainless nickel and the rest of the piece. And so it'll squish out this way, you know, like this. And then we'll just grind a bit out of it. I made an A for effort, but the original welds just aren't holding up. They're just not solid enough to keep the stainless in place. I was hoping the layer of nickel would help that, but it just didn't work for me. So that's okay. You know, same as last time. After forging it out, we'll uh, draw our lure out and go straight to drilling and grinding, which is going to be much easier in this case since we left this a flat bar instead of trying to hammer in some curvatures and rounding it out. So you can see these grinding ridges sort of going up and down here and that's from the belt and sort of dragging it across the belt with uneven pressure and I could put on like a scotch Brite belt or something and get those out of there and we're sand them out but um, I sort of like them there. I think it's going to add to the effect, you know, to be honest. We'll etch it and see what happens. This is UV light curing clear resin, commonly used on fishing lures. I built myself a cheap curing box with a cheap UV light in it, and let's just say these lures had to finish curing in the sun.
Okay, so now the question is how to fish these. My original intent was to take some barrels and a treble hook and just sort of yo-yo them through a pond or slope, maybe quick retrieve them. I don't, I don't do a lot of underwater bass fishing. I'm a fly fisherman and so I like to fly fish bass these days, but I use gurglers or poppers for top water stuff. Next, I think you could uh, maybe replace a blade on a spinner with one of these. They're a little, they're a little heavy, but I think that would work at any rate. You could vertically fish these like a spoon, I think. They're just big enough, but I don't really know how to do that. I've never done that before, and I'm not sure it's the right time of year for that. Um, but I might try that later in the fall. I think you could also maybe put a feathered hook on one side, and that would make these, I think, a little more attractive than just sort of fishing them by themselves. We don't have any feathered hooks. So um, this is where everything just sort of you know, falls apart. Like, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So, <laughs> um, but it's still been fun. And I think I'll still catch something on these regardless sort of how I try to fish them. So I think I'm gonna go with my original idea of a barrel hook, I mean a barrel uh, swivel on one side and then a treble hook on the other. And we'll just sort of do something simple like that for now. All right, spot number one's a small pond. And uh, it's well fished, but there's still some good fish in it. It's the middle of the day, 80 degrees in July. So it's not too hot and it's, um, Mostly cloudy now that I'm out here, the sun's out more than I want it, but there's a little breeze. Maybe good fishing, may not be good fishing. I'm gonna fish from the bank here for a little bit. The best spot where we're really gonna end up is over there. Obviously, love access to all this cool stuff over here. The pond outflow is over there, and, but uh, let's just do a little bit right here. I can't feel that it's spinning. I don't know if this is spinning or not. I guess it's, it's making some waves like it's spinning. Without anything to anchor to it, it's really not spinning. It's sort of flopping around and turns slowly, which isn't necessarily bad. But after about 10 minutes on the slow side of the pond, I move towards the hot spot, which juts out into the middle of the pond. Believe it or not, the biggest bass I've caught come from right there, right in the middle. There's some sort of structure there or something. There aren't a lot of weeds in this pond, but this lure is heavy enough that with a treble hook, it becomes pretty difficult to fish with a slow retrieve or even a yo-yoing up and down, the latter of which was how I was hoping to fish this lure. It really just gathers too many weeds. Ah, no! <laughs> no! Uh, I didn't even have the camera on. I had to get it out of my pocket so I couldn't set the hook. Ah! Yeah, I'm out of batteries. So I turned it off because I wouldn't have any luck anyway. And then I started burning it in fast on the surface. You guys probably saw that wasn't a big fish, but it would have been a moral victory. So I'm gonna have to take a break from my phone battery and there's a little bit of a rain delay and that's all too bad because I feel like I've just figured out how to retrieve this and keep it out of the weeds and still make it attractive for fish by burning it in just under the surface, giving it a few tugs so it just breaks the surface and then sinks quick and before I start reeling again. And I, I think that's gonna work. So at this point, I'm sort of bummed I have to take a break. Ooh. I got a bite at it. I don't think that was on camera because I was turned the other way. <laughs> this back part of the pond isn't fished much. I think because it's hard to reach and it looks pretty shallow. But I pulled a two-pound bass out of here just the other day. 
It's hard to see, so here's what happens. I throw the lure over towards the shore right about there, and as I pull it in, I get a strike. That's not bad. Yeah, of course I would have gotten a lot more action on a sticko or chatterbait here, but it's very cool this thing caught a fish. Let's string up our other lure as if it were a blade on this skirted spinner. First cast this thing. So heavy. <laughs> so heavy. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, holy cow. First cast. Are you kidding? I ate it. Yeah, that's a hefty one. It's hard to believe this thing was lurking in this little half acre pond. All these forged lures, spinners, or spoons, or blades. I don't know. Do they work better than normal lures? No. But man, this was fun and a great excuse to get outside. You guys have a good one.